As we all know, the leader of the free world wants to make America great again. And in his first State of the Union address earlier this week, the President said, we are restoring our strength and standing abroad. But the fact is, the world has changed. Democracies are becoming weaker, and America isn't the beacon it used to be. Don't just take my word for it. American think tanks have been pretty gloomy recently. Freedom House, for instance, a nonpartisan outfit based in Washington, D.C. It says, for the 12th consecutive year, countries that suffer democratic setbacks outnumbered those that registered gains. And it went on to say that countries like Turkey and Hungary, which had been looking quite promising, were now slipping down into authoritarian rule. Our own Prime Minister is in China at the moment, promoting a golden era of friendship. Not very surprising, given that China is such an economic powerhouse. But it's also becoming an awful lot more autocratic. Just think of that Swedish-Chinese publisher who was arrested by the secret police the other day. Maybe President Xi Jinping thinks that China's so rich nowadays it doesn't have to worry about what other people think. Vladimir Putin's coming up for another presidential election. And with the main opposition leader banged up yet again, the outcome is pretty certain. Two Harvard professors, Stephen Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt, have been arguing that, in fact, democracy can be killed at the ballot box. Once an anti-democratic leader gets in, he, and it always does seem to be a he, is pretty much in for as long as he wants, because every four or five years, he can stage a re-election all depressingly true. But the common thread running through all this doom and gloom is the apparent decline of the United States. It used to be a counterbalancing strength against countries like Russia. Not so much nowadays. Freedom House says that 88 countries are now what it calls free, while 49 are unfree. When I became a journalist back in 1966, the whole picture was far more gloomy. But the trouble is, it's turning in the wrong direction again. But the big difference is that in the past, the United States dominated the world, and now it doesn't. And many thanks to our friends at the Diner on the Strand. A few tequilas the merrier. John Simpson is here. Welcome back to the programme. Very nice to be back. Michael, is democracy on the defensive? Yes, I think it is. Um, indeed, I go further and say that uh, I would regard democracy still as largely experimental. There were only 11 democracies in the world in 1941. Uh, actually, even they weren't democracies because the United States didn't have black people voting at that stage. We'd only had women voting on equal terms since 1928. So a lot of the democracies came about in the 70s or the 80s or the 90s. And therefore, they have, uh, they have very uh, short roots. Uh, they're, they're not long established. Uh, this, is, this is an idea that is still on trial, I think. Um, I, I mean, you can look at it various ways. You can, you, I could say to John, well, look, things are much better now because black people are voting in the United States. And, you know, most of the Eastern Bloc that was under the subjugation of the Soviet Union uh, is, is now democratic. But he would then counter and say, but in the last few years, it's been moving in the other direction. That is absolutely right. And, and I worry about some of the characteristics of democracy, in particular, that democracy um, forces parties to vie with each other to promise too much. 
And the only way they can, if they win the election, the only way they can deal with this is to give people today what must be paid for tomorrow. Uh, and whether it's the Labour Party policy of you know, increasing public borrowing or whether it's the Labour and Conservative Party policy of the last few years of having public-private partnerships, it's all the same. It's all about giving rewards to voters today that must be paid for down the road. And, and I think that is a long-term threat to democracy. And if democracy is maybe even in retreat, certainly on the defensive, are we witnessing the rise of a new authoritarianism? In, without doubt. Um, China, Russia, also Turkey. Some, you know, medics this week have been mm. arrested because they protested against what Turkey was doing in Syria. Um, I am less pessimistic, perhaps not necessarily about the states, although I do think the checks and balances of the, you know, the judiciary, the NGOs, the media are uh, going full guns. I'm much more optimistic, particularly about Europe. Uh, you will remember, and in fact, you may even have said this, Michael, you know, predictions of doom and gloom on growth and the rise of populism there. Growth's back now, unemployment's down. Macron is uh, making a very optimistic pitch. So uh, I think you have to balance the worrying events that we see in China and Russia and places like Turkey. Nin Ninety a... members of the German parliament are from the far right. And that won't go away. The well, threat it's of never been before. Of, this is entirely of new. The threat mm. of the of populism. I think where the risks, 90. the where the risks really lie, I think is if liberal democracies allow globalisation to run rampant, uh, which I think is where the backlash, the populist oh. backlash, comes from, and if liberals themselves become intolerant of people with different views. One of the things that it seems to me have changed, John, is, is that as democracy gets into the problems that they've been talking about and others that authoritarianism has ceased to be something that just strong leaders like, the, the banana republic leaders of Latin America, mm -hmm. Franco in Spain and so on. But if you listen to the Kremlin or to Beijing, they actively propose authoritarianism mm -hmm. as a better way, don't they? Yes, they do. You see, the thing that really worries me is that China seems to have worked out a different way. In the past, all these old freaks with their medals and their uniforms have been in for 20, 30 years and so on. They, they never ran the country properly. Uh, it was deeply corrupt and ordinary people suffered. Well, China's actually deeply corrupt too, but it's a, a huge success story. It's lifting millions out of poverty. And in China, I spend a, a, quite a bit of time there. People always say to you, well, well why should we want all these, this democracy malarkey? Uh, we've got everything. We can just keep quiet here. We don't have to speak too loudly. Um, and, and we can make money. And it does worry me that that's, that's a kind of new, a new danger. That's a changing dynamic. You mm. never thought that would happen. Never. We always thought that authoritarianism in the end would lead to democracy. Mm. But at the moment in a number of places it's going in the opposite it direction. It does seem to be, yes, yes. Has the crash given this legs too? Because the crash was uh, caused by people who were earning millions and millions and millions and never really seemed to pay a price but the rest suffered austerity and wage stagnation and a sense that democracy wasn't delivering in the way it had for post-war generations. Well, I think while there, were, while there were still a number of communist countries in the world, it was easy to believe that capitalism and democracy were more or less the same thing because they were closely associated with each other. But it's now become rather clearer that they're almost opposites because democracy is all about uh, equality every five years or have, however often you vote whereas capitalism is all about inequality. I mean, it doesn't work unless some people do better than others, otherwise you're not encouraged to participate. So I think it's taken a while for us to realise that there is this divergence between the two. And I, I suspect that, you know, whereas you can say to people, uh, look, don't worry about a bit of inequality because you get to vote every five years. And that may work at a diversity of one to 20 between the pay of a nurse and the pay of a, mm. an investment banker. Uh, at one to two thousand, it probably doesn't work quite as well. And that ratio has got wider. And the uh, ratio has got wider. wider. You said you were a bit more optimistic, Liz. But I, I mean, I remember 
uh, when democracy seemed to have triumphs every two or three years. Portugal, mm -hmm. Spain, Greece all ceased mm -hmm. to be fascist countries and joined democratic Europe, the liberation of Eastern Europe, even for a period, Russia itself. These were all being chalked up. Now I think back over the past five years or ten years even, where has democracy triumphed? Well, it has gone backwards in many places. Um, the Arab Spring, we, essentially a democratic yeah. failure, perhaps uh, Tunisia a bit. but As we look ish, forward, though, I mean, I'd be interested in what John thinks about this. You know, our the soft power of America and Europe, uh, our incredible universities, which many young people from China are coming to study at, uh, the dominance of our language, of our popular culture and sport. Do you think that over time that those things will have an influence even in a deeply authoritarian country like China? Oh, yeah, I think, I think we're, we're, we're seeing that uh, quite clearly. Um, when Auntie May goes there, uh, she gets... <laughs> it's her uh, new name. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to stick. It is it? going to um, stick. Uh, you know, people, uh, people have a, a, a respect for Britain because of what they've heard about it in the past. But, you know, political weakness does eat away at, at that. And Britain is more is weaker politically than at any time in my in my career since the, the 70s. Um, and it, that does tell. They can and sense that. They can sense it just as they can sense. Uh, you don't even need to sense it that that um, uh, Donald Trump is somebody that everybody uh, seems to want to laugh at um, and that he's obsessed with things that don't relate to the outside world. And that cuts back on American soft power, just as British political weakness cuts back on our soft power. I think, I mean, you the, you can make a very good case for saying that a couple of years ago, Britain uh, had the greatest soft power in the world and and maybe second to America, maybe maybe but ahead there, of America, two, yeah. but it's it, one or two. Um, that, I think, is is fading at the moment. Maybe it'll come back, but it's fading now. I want to come uh, finish on this point you made about America, because I can remember, particularly during the Cold War, when the complaint, especially from the left, was that America was too dominant, mm. that America was even a threat to democracy. It interfered in uh, democratic procedures. But now you, you, your argument is interesting that the withdrawal of America becoming less important is helping the rise of authoritarianism and is one of the causes of the decline of democracy. I, th I feel that quite strongly. I don't think that America is pulling back as much as it seems when you listen to Donald Trump's mm. words. He doesn't really put very much of these words into, into operation. No, it's, fact, it is largely words. It is words, but words are all the rest of us have got, you know? You, you, you sit there, you sit in Beijing, you sit in Moscow, you sit in Paris or London, and all you hear is, is what Donald Trump is saying and you don't see very much about the little that he's doing. May I just say, don't be too rosy about the past. The United States routinely supported dictatorships in Latin America. Indeed, it wasn't a great help to Iran in the early 50s either. Mm. But just, we need to go, but just very quickly, what we've been talking about, you all seem to agree, but is this a, a short-term phenomenon that will change, or is this the shape of things to come, yes or no? Uh, shape of things to come. If we have confidence in our values... Uh, it need not be. I think everything's quite short term nowadays. These days. Uh, I think it'll be up. What's up will be down, and what's mm -hmm. down will be up. John, great to have you back again. It's good to see you.